Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I think you'll uh, you'll enjoy the presentation. We're going to start as usual. We'll begin with some announcements, and uh, most of these uh, I'll just leave on the screen as as they go by. Uh, and I will leave the information on the table so following the presentation tonight, if you want more information or record a, an email address or whatever, uh, feel free to do so. So, the one thing that's important to recognize at this time is that we do live stream and record our, our presentations uh, this way or down the road if you uh, happen to not be able to attend one of our meetings in the future. Recognize that you can come and attend it online uh, so that uh, it, it provides an opportunity for you to keep up with the, the activities of the Desert Branch. We would like to know uh, if you would like to share uh, throughout the, the night tonight. Uh, if you are, how many are new to the, to the OGSS expansion tonight? Good. Welcome very much. Welcome to the to the presentation. Uh, if you would like to share with some of the executives uh, at the end of the meeting or later on, uh, who, what family name, and so on that you are researching, it might be helpful because you might find that we we have connections uh, with uh, many of the names, so you might be able to help you out in that regard. As indicated, we are part of an Ontario provincial organization. These are some resources that we have available. The resource collection, the monthly meetings, obviously, and a website which is growing and growing and growing in terms of information that is useful to you in your family history research. The website for our branch Email address, I said, they say these will be on the uh, on the table at the end of the meeting. Please feel free to use them uh, to contact the uh, Essex branch people uh, if you have a question. Uh, just an announcement here uh, each year, the Ontario government provides uh, awards for volunteer service to a variety of organizations, and uh, on April 14th, uh, Six of the uh, members of the branch of OGS uh, receive volunteer service awards. So, uh, if you would like to join us, we certainly would like to have more volunteers. Uh, so, please, if you are considering it or interested in contributing, uh, see one of the executives sometime this evening. Just a little bit of an announcement for the future. Uh, next month's meeting. Uh, it is about the British home children, and we're very fortunate to have uh, Sandra Joyce coming out of the Toronto area, who her father, as it said, was a British home child. She's done a lot of work and research and publications related to this topic, so it's a, a topic probably uh, you would not like to miss uh, next month in June. One thing to remember, the library is on summer hours next month. Okay, so six o'clock start rather than seven o'clock start. Okay, we get kicked out at eight instead of nine. So uh, please be aware of that. And if you have any friends who may be attending, make sure they're aware of the uh, of the change in time. Uh, we do not meet in the summer, July or August, and uh, I think sometimes the September meeting also goes to six o'clock till they finish their uh, their summer hours. Something you might want to be interested in, and it may still in 1812 encampment, 21st and 22nd of May. Uh, if you're into the war, uh, 1812 war material, uh, this is maybe something that you would like to attend. The Black History Tour on May 19th, 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. to 10, 2 p.m. from the Chichero Club, led by Chris Carter. And uh, if you have not had an opportunity to make that tour, it's uh, most informative and very worthwhile. 
conference is coming up, the presidential conference, three to five in June, uh, and it is held in Toronto. Uh, I understand it's being very well uh, enrolled. So uh, if you're interested at all in getting some detailed information related to family history research, uh, it's a nice home place to, uh, a nice sort of conference to attend. Today's topic, cross-border research. We live really in a very unique area in that we have the closeness of the U.S. with Detroit and Michigan and Essex County together. As I'm sure you all know and you know perhaps your own family, uh, they have had relatives in the Windsor, Essex area and in the Detroit, Michigan area. And a lot of back and forth went, went uh, occurred uh, over the years. So uh, this presents an interesting issue doing research in both the U.S. and in Canada. And we're very pleased to have with us tonight uh, Deborah Honors, who is going to talk a little bit about this issue of cross-border research. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, okay. Um, one other thing that I will mention, uh, a very interesting uh, opportunity to explore Windsor Essex. Uh, occurs in September. It's called Doors Open Ontario, and it will be held in, on September 24th, 25th, the weekend of this year, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And you have an opportunity to uh, have a tour of uh, some of the Windsor's most interesting streets and buildings. So keep that in the back of your mind come September, and take advantage of the opportunity to go places where you might not normally be able to go and learn a little bit about the history of Windsor in a different format. There are some of the brochures regarding this uh, on the uh, table at the back. Uh, please feel free to pick that up uh, when you, uh, when you, uh, at the end of the meeting, so. Okay, as I said, very pleased to have with us tonight, Deborah Honor. Deborah is no stranger to people who have been associated with OGS. She's been a former regional director, president of the Essex branch, and longtime uh, member of the branch, and uh, very well informed and very interesting presentation as well. So, uh, without further ado on my part, uh, let's welcome Deborah Meyer. Thanks, Jim. I see you left my papers here. That's good. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay. Did everybody get the handout? Okay. Sometimes it helps to have another piece of paper to at least write on the back <laughs> or write on the front. As if I didn't put something in the actual handout, you can write it in. Anybody wants one? We have them here. Good. Nice. Here. It's just a general outline and it has some of the uh, websites that I've used. It was very nice of uh, Jim to introduce me. Uh, there was a different name down for most of the time for this guest, uh, for the speaker, and she couldn't make it tonight, so I flew in <laughs> to, to uh, take over. So I hopefully I can give you similar type of information. I've never seen her talk, so it's not her talk, it's, it's my talk. Okay, let's start with cross-border families. There are two words that we need to understand, immigration and emigration. You immigrate to a country, you emigrate from a country. And most of the people in North America have emigrated from other parts of the world to North America, except for the native people of the country. So once in North America, for most of our time period here, there is a fluid border crossing between our two countries. 
because at times we were part of the same country as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the honors, uh, my husband's family. They came from Ireland into New York. They stayed in New York for three years. Then they moved to Kingston, Ontario, up to Port Hope. Then in 1843, some of them, not all of them, moved to Amsburg. Some of those that came to Amsburg then moved over to Michigan. Then some of them moved to Minnesota, Montana, California, Oregon, and Yukon. So your family could be spread all over North America, and, it, and but your section of the family stayed here in the one spot. It's everybody, it's all the other brothers and the cousins that moved. And if, when you're doing a whole family history, instead of just your direct line, you need to be able to find them. And how do you find them? Grab the right one. So these are some of the reasons for crossing the border. Opportunities for economic gain. In other words, you want a job. Some of the jobs in the early days were the lumber camps over in Michigan. A lot of people moved over for that. The shipping and the sailing on the Great Lakes. A lot of the honors became captains on, on the Great Lakes. Uh, jobs in the automotive area. Over in Detroit, a lot of people from Canada moved over for those kind of jobs in the early 1900s. And there's lots of other places where you could go to where you were looking for some kind of opportunity for a good job. Go West, young man, was one of those titles you hear of all the time over in the United States. Well, even moving from Kingston to, um, to Amherstburg is moving west. <laughs> so, you know, it started on the, on, with the 13 colonies, and you're, you're going to move west at just about any other time. <laughs> the gold rush. Now, it says the gold rush, but really there's more than one. So there's different time periods, different places where they could have gone in the gold rush. You're visiting family. When you cross a border, it doesn't mean you're going to stay there. It could be, oh, I'm just going over to Detroit to visit my cousin, and then I'll be back in, in a couple of hours. There's also the chance of elopement and marriage over on the other side. And that works both ways. And then there's death. But I'll come to that one at the end. So, searching for your family. These are some of the things that you can use to search for your family. And this is written right on your handout. Newspaper announcements and queries is a way of finding your family. Census records, cross-border records, immigration records, they are different. Naturalization records and funeral records are all ways of finding where somebody lived. So with cross-border marriages, it's sort of like the idea we've got now, destination marriages. Everybody goes off and gets married at some tropical island now. Not that the rest of the family gets to go with them. I was to, I was to meet one of my cousins this week. I wanted to meet her in Stratford because I'm going up to Stratford. And she says, oh, I'm sorry, Deb, I can't be there. Um, I'm going out to Calgary to be with my son. He and his longtime girlfriend uh, went on a vacation to Thailand and got married. So I'm going out to visit them. In the old days, they didn't go quite that far. <laughs> but uh, there were destination marriages. And one of the ways of doing a destination marriage was to take the new kind of transportation, railroads. So you would get on the train and you would go to some place on the train to get in, to the next city or wherever, how far you wanted to go on the train. You'd get married and then you'd come back home. You sort of have the marriage and the, and the uh, what do you call it? Honeymoon. Honeymoon at the same time. Thank you. <laughs> it has. <laughs> Okay, so I have a very interesting great uncle, my uncle Edmund Leach. Um, when he he lived in Ridgetown, okay, 
And there, back in the 70s, somebody was doing the family history and they said, we want to know about your, um, your great uncle Edmund Leach. Well, my grandfather was not going to talk about Edmund. He said it's up to Edmund to talk about his side of the family. That's his business. And I asked my mom, okay, why won't Uncle Eddie talk about his, his family? My mom says, oh, he was married multiple times. <laughs> so in the, in the last year, I have found six marriages. Oh, oh, wow. um, the records are now becoming available in Michigan. It's very nice. What's the nice thing is I have also found five of the divorces. Oh, yeah. The divorce papers are also available online now on Ancestry. So I now have proof that all of the marriages were legal. All of these marriages happened before my cousins were born. The last wife is the only one we ever knew. And so that's why he didn't want anybody else to know. So this is the very first marriage I found. If you go to the Chatham-Kent Library, they have an index file, you know, the old index cards. And this was the first one I found. So on the 5th of September, 1923, two young ladies from Blenheim entered the matrimony field a few days ago in Port Huron. Miss Harriet Wagner, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Paul Wagner, was married to Edmund Leach of Richtown. Miss Muriel Collar, daughter of Mr. and Mrs. J. Herbert Collar, to Arnold Trott, also of Richtown. The young brides are visiting at their homes here, the grooms having taken a trip on the harvest excursion to the west. <laughs> on their return, the former couple will reside in Richtown and the latter will uh, live in Port Huron. This marriage ended in divorce in 1920. I wrote down the right, the wrong number, definitely, because I've got the divorce in 1922. Well, that would be before the marriage. So that, <laughs> I must have written that one wrong. It was about 1924. That was only about two years, 24, 25. So cross-border marriages, you can find them in the newspaper. There's an elopement. Why did they go to, would they have gone to Michigan for the laws? Uh, the maybe parents didn't like who they were, who they wanted to marry. They could have gotten a child so, in Michigan. Maybe it was just the whole lot. Well, the other couple wanted to stay in Port Huron. Oh, okay. Gotcha. okay maybe so it was yeah, just, gotcha. well, we're going anyways. You might as well come with us. Okay, thank you. The two guys left. <laughs> they left, the, they, they took the women home and then. Please. Took them, yeah. <laughs> but these are things you think about, right? Like, why would they go? Maybe that was where the train was going. Was the train could go from Ridgetown to Port Huron, and then they cross the border, do the marriage, and then come back. Okay. So, newspaper queries. These are for usually. Um, I know when, when I first started, which is way back in the Middle Ages, uh, there were only writing letters, and you would write to the newspaper in Ireland and say, I think my family is from this county, yes, does anybody have any connections to this? Well, the same thing was happening in North America. And one of the newspapers is called the Boston Pilot. And those records are in a book. Um, from the New York Historical Genealogical Society in 1989, but Ancestry now has that online. Okay, it's also on a website there, uh, the Boston College website. I've got that on your uh, page too. But what people would do is they would write from Ireland to North America. I know my brother came on such and such a year to Louisiana, and they're writing to Boston, <laughs> to Louisiana, and we've lost contact with them. Does anybody have any contact? The Boston Pilot was a Catholic newspaper. Ireland had mainly Catholics, so they're looking 
because that newspaper probably was published and spread out most over the United States, that they would get the most coverage to try and find their family member. Now, the one that I have an example for is in my husband's family. It is not found on that website. It's, I think I found it on Ancestry. Somebody else found it for me, but it was on Ancestry. It is not on that other website, the Boston College, but it's a little bit different. It is basically somebody searching for somebody else, but it's somebody searching for them, and she's living in London, Ontario, not in Ireland. She's living in London, Ontario, and she's asking for her brothers and sisters. Where are my brothers and sisters? So she has of William, James, Bridget, and Mary Aspel. I put capital letters for the last names. Children of William and Anna Aspel. William, when last heard from, was in Quebec. James was in Troy, New York. Bridget had married John Phelan, a boot and shoemaker. He could be traveling. And was living in Quebec. Mary had married Francis Mulvey and immigrated, immigrated with him to the Lake Superior Copper Mines. Information of the above parties would be gladly received by Joanna Aspel of London, Ontario. She gave her maiden name. She did not give her married name, even though she'd been married for quite a while. So underneath, I've got Joanna Mary John Proger. John Proger was a military army person in London. They met probably in Montreal because that's where her family was from. Her family were Irish Catholic. As a member of the British Army and English, he was Anglican. Therefore, father disowned her. So this is her trying to find her family members after her father probably has passed away. But it gives us a clue as to where the different family members were living. So that's 1870. Okay, census records. Why is my family not found in the census? Have you come across any of those? I know they have to be in Leamington in 1871 and they're not there. Could be a spelling mistake. But I've looked through all of Mercia Township and I can't find them. But that's my butler side. This is my baker's side. The baker's side has a little bit different story. So the example is my great grandmother's name is Margaret Eula Baker. And her parents. Um, are not found in the 1911 census. That's because that was the year her father went over to Detroit to get a job. Okay? A little later on, the rest of the family follows, but it's all in 1911. So therefore, they're not in the 1900 U.S. Census because they're still in Ridgetown. They moved the wrong year for them to show up in a census record. Shouldn't they show up somewhere, though? Why? <laughs> because the census happens every year at that date, and everyone lives somewhere. They should show up somewhere in the census. If you are in Detroit mm -hmm. in 1911, mm -hmm. You will not be in the Canadian census in 1911. Will they not be in the American census in 1911? Because they didn't move until 1911. The 1900 census, the 1910 census oh, is the census oh, 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 oh. for the US. I, Sorry. Okay, you missed that part. I don't want to say 1900, <laughs> but it's 1910. I'm sorry. You do the math? Yes. <laughs> okay, I, if I, you're I, going yeah. to ask questions, I did. then you will get an answer. That, well, but you, I had to. And I may you. have to be corrected, but that's okay. I had to pull it out of you. But, but believe it, you are right. They wouldn't be in the 1910 census yeah, yeah, yeah. because they weren't there yet. 
Right. They moved in 1911, and therefore they're not in the 1911 Canadian census. But you didn't. I, I got them wrong. Deborah just so I, them again. I was never good at math. Deborah, I love you. You are so wonderful. Keep going. I'll shut up. <laughs> okay. Is that a problem? No, you answered. No, you answered the question. Okay. I did not. I did not know that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I had the opposite. When my husband's mother moved from the states, she's in both senses. In both senses. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because mm -hmm. they were living in the states the first year, and then in the old mm -hmm. Yes, and then you're you're lucky because yeah. they're in both senses. I also have a, a, a case with this. I think it's the same family over in Michigan. The uh, children are named in the census with the parents, but because Grandma babysat, she also had the children in the same census under her name because they were there at her house that day, and she used the name she liked. <laughs> so they weren't exactly the same names as what mom and dad had. They were close enough you could tell it was the same kids. Okay, back to work. Okay. Yes. Well, I've had the same thing with um, the English and Canadian census, which is usually done the same year, but they were actually in transit. And so they got missed. Yeah. And both things are then Yeah. Well, they get missed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Census records can also be used for showing movement of the family. So it's not just are they in the census, but how many censuses can you find them? So when you find a census, here's a census for Henry Honor, uh, born in 1862, I don't have his death date, married Bertha Butcher in California in 1890 in Solana, Solana California. Uh, here's the children's names. Now, what, look at the children's names here. We've got Hazel Inez, who was born in 1891 in Amherstburg, Ontario. Myrna is born in California. Ralph Stanley is born in Amherstburg, Ontario. <laughs> Ruth is born in California. Now, I have to explain Herbert Clyde, because in some of the census records, it just says, Canada. So wouldn't you expect Annisburg, Ontario? No! He's born in Dawson, Yukon. And I've got other proof that his father went in the gold rush to the Yukon for at least three years. He was a miner. And he took his wife. Oh, yeah. <laughs> story is his wife really liked the Yukon and she had two maiden sisters so whenever she had a child she'd leave them in California with them to raise and she'd go back up to the Yukon <laughs> that's just the story I don't have any proof and then the last one's born in Sonoma California okay so when you look at the census record make sure you check where the children were born because that shows you the immigration of the family, and it could be a ever different state for every child because they're moving farther west. Especially if they were in the military. The military as well. Military is, they could be born in, in India, they could be born Jamaica. in Jamaica, they could be born in Canada, and then they're back out to uh, Australia. Military records with the children's uh, births are fabulous. It's a great way of, of tracing your, uh, the way they go. Now, census can also be used as a timeline in a timeline of a family. Have you ever written up a timeline on a family? So, it, it actually writing it out really helps you to understand where they were and what they may have been doing, okay? So I've got on my mother's side of the family, Dougal Alexander Leach, Mary Elizabeth Taylor, who said, I'm related to Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> it just happens. It's a different one. Oh, uh, well. Uh, 1900, he was married, uh, was working in Ridgetown in the lumber business. And that was the business that his father owned. Okay. 1911 census, he's still in Ridgetown. He's a basket factory manager. Still the same company, it's just being more specific as to what the company does. 
But by 1921 census, 10 years later, he's now a florist. So the company could have closed, but this would be something that you'd have to research. Go into Bridgetown newspapers and, and see if the company closed or if it was sold or why, why is he now a florist? 1924 is when he crosses into Detroit, Michigan as a florist. In 1925, a year later, he has moved to Pontiac, Michigan as a florist. So knowing sometimes the job also helps with figuring out things on a timeline. By 1930 in Pontiac, Michigan, he's a mill worker for the auto factory. He's now, he's now left the uh, florist business. Um, and then in 1935, he moves back to Norwich, Ontario. Does not move back to Bridgetown. Moves to Norwich. Not that far apart. He opens up a grocery store. In the same town, his brother has a grocery store. We now have two grocery stores run by two brothers. Maybe they're not, so not the same grocery store. They're, maybe they're not really competing. One might sell bread and the other sell vegetables. But I, I, Who knows? Yeah. But anyways, why did he leave Michigan? In I, I, I've, got a, I've got a suggestion, okay? Depression. Could be depression. 1930, when they had gone over to Michigan, his oldest son, Edmund, remember Edmund? He'd already been married once, so the older kids were getting married already. He had two younger kids and he took over to Michigan with him still, that were minors. And the youngest son, Gordon, in 1930, drowned in an accident in the pond. And I'm wondering if that sort of killed it for the wife and said, I want to be back with more family. The uh, daughter who moved over stayed in Michigan. She had married uh, an American by this time, so, you know, it's just the two of them now. Let's move back into Canada and be with the family. That's my reasoning, but who knows? I think that could even be a little bit deceiving like the florist, but who's to say that Elizabeth was in the florist rather than Douglas? Because it just says cross into Michigan. Oh no, it says beside his name. In his name on the records, it says oh, okay. that he was a florist. Oh, okay. Okay? So the list for she. No, we'll get into those things. Stay at home, my wife. Housewife. <laughs> okay, cross border records. Now, the, cross, the border crossing records from Canada to the US began in 1895. They include people coming in ships and trains through Canada to the United States, either for a visit or a stay. People who crossed the border in any other way, if they swam across the river, if they went by horse or car, they are not in the records because they were transferring people by boats and, and um, trains are the only, at the beginning, were the only ways that they were collecting the information for cross-border. Those might have been people who were more likely to be going, put it to, to uh, immigrate or to stay for a while, where the people... No. Wrong. I'm just going to finish my sentence, thank you. No. Because Detroit people, and Windsor Ferry counts. That's what I'm saying, I'm about to ask But you. people go across the, by ferry just to visit. Yeah, and my grandfather ran the whole from there. Yeah, so and, but we that's just this so people just that's why I said people here just want to cross back and forth. But those people, the yeah, first paragraph, appear to be more likely to be transiting, more likely to stay permanently or longer term. You would think so. That's why I'm but because saying we this, have a water border between the United States and Canada. That's what that is. That's why we have records at Detroit, because it's a river. We have border crossing records. They're not going to have records up in Quebec crossing into Maine because there is no water there to cross over. You can step over the border. 
it's like we went we went down through uh, Manitoba to South Dakota and North Dakota, and my son says, "Where's the bridge?" <laughs> 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 oh, got a train. <laughs> Anyways, okay, I got all that. So, some sources for the cross border records are on FamilySearch.org, which is a free site. Okay, so this article describes multiple collections. The collections consist of indexes of aliens and citizens crossing into the United States from Canada. So, those records are showing both Canadians crossing. And Americans crossing. This a set of American records? These are American records into the United States from Canada. So, through various ports of entry along the US Canadian border between 1895 and 1956. Ancestry has two sets of records they have the US border crossings from Canada to the US. And they have the border crossings from the U.S. back into Canada. So you've got, there's two separate sets. So when you cross the border to go over to Detroit, you're not stopped by Canadian immigration. You're only stopped by the Americans. Similarly, when you come across from Detroit, you're not stopped by the American side, you're stopped by the Canadian side. So that's the difference. That's how you figure out coming and going. Yes. There's one more on there. It's, it's, um, I'm not sure if it's under ancestry.com or ancestry.ca, but it's called the Detroit Passenger List. Yes, the Detroit and Passengers that List. That one, yeah, because it's not listed under the uh, country, but it specifically says Detroit. Yes. It's another, another one that has the border crossing records. Exactly, and that's the one I use the most, too. <laughs> okay. I, would, I wanted to show you something that a cousin gave me just a couple of, uh, within the last year. This is the boarding crossing record of my mother and my aunt Clara. And my mother's on the left, and it's uh, their ages 15 and 13. This is a non-resident aliens border crossing identification card. Reasons for the card. Well, it's 1943. What's happening? War. 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 They need to know who people are and can they be trusted, even though they're 15 and 13 years old. Reasons for the card. Why would they need a card to cross? They haven't needed a card before. They could just use a baptism card. Well, for security is one. It's an official card of the government. Yes. The government issued it. It's not the church or whatever. Right, it's an official document. It has their picture. <clears throat> it has her father's signature on it as well, as well as, as my mother Doris. Reasons for the card also would be, we have family members. Remember the Baker family? That's her grandfather. He's still living over in Detroit, so he's, she could be going over to visit her grandfather. She could be going over to visit Uncle Eddie. Because <laughs> Uncle Eddie lived in Michigan. <laughs> <He's in her laughs> All right. And maybe there were others in the family that she was going over to visit. But she had her sister on there as well, though her sister is not recognized as the person <laughs> holding the card. Yes? I had a long resident in there for a crossing card when I worked on Bobble in 59. We used to take the boat back to Detroit on Oh, cool. I had to be bigger and bigger than my mother's house. Not the same. <laughs> oh. Crossing from Bobolo to Detroit. Oh, <laughs> exciting. <laughs> I had to say something because I don't know if it would pick up on the recording. After hours. After hours. Oh. oh <laughs> yes. Now, why are two pictures for one, two humans for one, for one card? So That's a good question. Of, you know, each of them should have their own card. I would think. Wouldn't you think? Who am I to be? Right. Because it says in the middle, accompanied by Clara. Oh, oh, oh I'm right sorry. in the middle. Oh, oh. So it gives all the information for my mom. My mom was born in Leamington. She's a Canadian. She was born November 13, 1928. She's accompanied by Clara. So we have to have a picture of Clara too. Okay, I, but it doesn't say who is who. I guess. She, I guess maybe they didn't trust Clara to cross on her own. Because she was only 13. And the old is 15. 15. Old enough. Well, the older, 
old enough, old enough to maybe have responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Sorry, dear. Do you have any idea whether she used that card more than once? Well, it, it looks pretty beat up. <laughs> That's it's, a little one. it's got scotch tape all over it. <laughs> she wouldn't always be going with it. She might not always be going with the sister. Correct. Uh -huh. I have Ron's original one. Yes. He was three years old. Mm. Yes. And when we were dating, <laughs> he was like 18 years old. And we would go across the border and he'd show it to the guy. And they would let him across with it. And he's got his picture when he's three years old. And one yes. day the guy says to him, he says, I think you better update that. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Who are you? Okay. So these are the cross boarding cross. The border crossing cards that you will find online for, for the Detroit uh, border crossing. Um, I wanted to show you what the whole document looks like. Basically, it's an index card and they flipped it over and they photocopied both sides. The only problem is the right side is upside down. So it makes it difficult to read. So what I did was I cropped and pasted and then rotated, cropped and pasted the other side and put them together so that you could read both sides for the rest of this production. So what type of information was given is a good thing to learn for these kind of documents. And also, is it reliable? Can you believe everything that people tell you when you're crossing the border? Okay. The next three slides are not my family. They are somebody who, who gave me permission to use them because he had asked me to do some research for him on his grandfather. His grandfather is Gerald Robinson. This is his 1931 card. I know when, when people write, people always talk about cursive writing. It's a bit of a curse sometimes because it's difficult to read. But anyways, this is Gerald Elmer Robinson. Has the most information I have ever found on, a cro on the border crossings at Detroit. And I have found three of his border crossings so far. So this is Robinson, Gerald Elmer. He's alone. He's age 17 years, male, single laborer. I won't be reading all of this for all of them. Place of birth, Aurora, Ontario. Money showing, nothing. Address, Canada, Windsor, Ontario. Destination, Detroit, Michigan. Ever in the US? Yes, in 1916. Going to join sister-in-law, Alice Robinson, at 5157 Lily Bridge, Detroit. Purpose, visit. So in this information, you now know who one of his brothers married, where they live in Detroit. You could look up in a city directory and find out what the brother's name is if you don't know. Height, five foot two inches, complexion, mid, hair brown, eyes brown, relative in Canada. So they're telling you where they're going specifically and who they've left behind. A brother, Ewart, at 1433 Howard, Windsor, Ontario. Now the second side of the card is very interesting because on it it says, previously deported. Interesting, deported. Okay, that's 1931. Here's 1938. Okay, it gives his name, July, it's July 1st, 1938. Beside it, it says, or behind, under it, it says, alias Elmer Robertson. He has an alias now. Sounds a lot like Elmer Robinson, but it's El Elmer Robertson. Instead of using his first name, he's using his middle name. Um, his wife's name now, he's now married, has Margaret Robinson, ever in the U.S., Various times. Deported? Yes. <laughs> Spring, 1930. Now it gives us the date as to when he was deported. From Detroit. He was deported from Detroit. 
His destination, he's going to visit his brother, Frederick Robinson, in Wabash, Grand River Avenue, Detroit. His sister is Mrs. Marjorie Crosley in Flint, Michigan. So he's got more than one member of the family over there. Money showing. One dollar, it's moving up. <laughs> Ever arrested, yes, on January the 10th, 1931. Deported, yes, July 1935. Purpose of visit, visit one hour. This is 1938, remember. Um, second side of the card. Previous deported crime. This is the only card that actually says why. Theft and forgery. And I'm sure the CIV and the PC afterwards has some information to it, but I don't know what it is. This alien hereby named deported by me. In other words, he didn't make it in this time. <laughs> they sent him back. Now, you know yourselves, when you cross over to Detroit, you are not stopped and taken into the customs office every single time you go across. And this is probably the same example for him. These are the times he got caught crossing. These are not the times he did not stop. So there's probably other times he has crossed. They just haven't stopped him. 1944, getting towards the end of the war, he's going through the tunnel, it says this time. I don't know where the other two were, whether it was the bridge or the tunnel, but this one's the, uh, this one's the tunnel. Alias, Harold. <laughs> Sounds like Gerald. You know, if you've got a name that sounds similar, you'll be able to answer to it better. Gerald, Harold. Um, wife Edith. Well, Edith, he has a different wife now. At least the name's different. Ever in U.S. Lived in 1925 in the U.S. to 1929 in Lansing and Detroit, Michigan. Destination, indefinite address. <laughs> Money. Four dollars. <laughs> Ever arrested. Yes, deported. Yes. Or excluded from admission. Yes. He's honest on those parts. I guess they can look it up. I don't know. Visit one day. Second side of the card has medical certificate afflicted in Jan on with January the 17th, 1944, OEB, I have no idea, hernia in gernal. Hernia. That's a note. All right. And then he has written on his own card, I hereby withdraw my application for admission to U.S. Signed, Gerald Elmer Robinson. <laughs> he knows he's not going to get in. <laughs> So, that's the worst one, <laughs> but the amount of information on there is just so much fun because it really shows some of the stuff he's probably telling the truth and other stuff he might not be telling the truth. You have to decide or you have to find the information to support or to disprove what he has on there. Yes, Jim. Uh, would these be written up every time you cross into the States? No. You know, like when you cross into the States, they don't always pull you over to the customs office. This would be a time that they would pull you over to the customs office. I was going to say, if they did it every time for everybody... We should all be in there multiple times. Wouldn't that be a great way of doing genealogy? <laughs> We've been looking at those forever. Yes? Uh, one thing that I noticed is... Um, one previous to this one, the other one, and it was like when the guards are not busy. It was said seven, seven in the evening. The other one said seven in the evening. Oh, did it? So it's like, well, that's there's a certain time you want to cross and not a certain exactly. time. Well, that's a good thing. Thank you. Yes. Uh, both my brother and I suffer from what's called trigger finger. It gets stuck in a crooked position. 
Okay. Anyway, my father had that as well. And I found my grandfather's um, uh, 40 cross. And on the back of it, it says uh, remarks. And on it, it said crooked little finger. Yes, he has a description on one of his <laughs> right hand scarred index finger. Yeah. So it gives you other information there, too. Okay, let's move on. Frank A. Baker, that's my Margaret Beulah Baker's, actually her stepfather, it's not her father. Um, says his birthplace is Mullen, Devonshire, England. What is nice about this one, it gives the name of a cousin in London, which I did not know until I got this card, Fred Cook, because the, the last name's not the same. And, but, and he's going to a rooming house. So the date on this one is uh, December the yeah December the fourth, nineteen eleven. This is the family that moved. Whoops, moved in nineteen eleven and wasn't in the census, and then they were yeah, those those people that didn't show up. Um, so we've got them in the in the border crossing records instead, which proves why they weren't in the census. But the bottom is the part that I love the best. Seaport and date of landing and name of ship. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give just Detroit, Michigan on the 3rd of December, 1911. He also gives Quebec, May 17th, 1903. That is the date he emigrated from England into Canada. So I have a bonus on that card. Something I would totally never expect to find on the Detroit border crossing. And it says the SS Lake Manitoba. Now I can look up in Library and Archives Canada for that ship and that date and find him on the passengers list. So that was a nice bonus. Okay, now here's Clara Baker. She's the wife. She's my great grandmother. She is crossing the border. I guess I can use this one. Now, her name is right there, Clara Baker. See all that, that writing over top? See the ones above? They're quite clear. Hers, uh, Beulah Baker, which is my great-grandmother, and her brother Martin, and her brother Gordon. They all have the same writing all over the top of them. They were detained. Now, they were admitted on appeal by the secretary. That's what it says up above their names. On the 11th of December, 1911. So the husband goes over first on the 3rd of December. They come on a different day, and they're finally admitted on the 11th. I don't know how long they were detained. It might have been just a couple of hours. It might have been a day or two even. I don't know. But they were going to go and live with the husband over in Michigan. Would be any records of the detaining? There may be records of the detaining, but they may not be uh, public. I don't, I don't know. But these are the kind of records. Now, what I did with this record, I've cut it in half because they were at the very bottom of the page, and I wanted you to see what the top of the page looked like as well. So there's a whole bunch of other names in between. You can see the bottom one says it says number eighteen. And it was not used, and that way they could tell that somebody wasn't missing. Okay, Dougal Alexander in 1924. Now, this is the son, or this is the, the father of Edmund, my Uncle Eddie. Um, the date that he uh, was going through is April the 2nd, 1924. Gives his description, just like everybody else. Read and write, yes. I was watching a, the, one of the family history shows on TV just right lately, and they said in 1917, the US government said that to stop some people coming immigrating into the United States, that they had to read and write. If they could not read and write, they were deported back to the, back to the home country. So that's a very important thing for them to be asked. Money shown. Oh, I thought you'd like this one. It's a hundred dollars. My family's rich. <laughs> it's not bad. 
Uh, last permanent address was Ridgetown. He paid for his own passage. Ever in the U.S.? No. Going to join relative John Leach of Grace Harbor Lumber Com Company, Detroit, Michigan. So he's saying he's going to Detroit. He's going to become a permanent resident. His, his uh, purpose of coming is employment. Enter to become U.S. citizen? Yes. Accompanied by none. Uh, nearest relative was his wife Elizabeth in Ridgetown. That was Elizabeth Taylor. And remarks, wife on the other side. Oh, he came by ferry, so it was the Detroit Windsor Ferry. D and W ferry is what they usually write on there. That's the ferry my grandfather was the engineer on. Yeah. The D and W. Uh, on the remarks on the other side, it said, wife and two children in good health will follow later. So his was April the 2nd, right? Their next one was Elizabeth. She came April the 6th, like four days later. Um, no money. She had no money on her because her husband would have picked her up in Detroit, you know, off the ferry. Um, going to join relative of a friend, to relative or friend. She's going to meet her husband. Now, how many days was this apart from the other one? Four days? His addresses are R3 Pontiac. Boy, did he move fast. He was going to Detroit. Now he's in Pontiac. Time remaining in U.S. is permanent. Purpose of coming. I like this one. Domicile. <laughs> Intend to become U.S. citizen, yes. She's accompanied by Dorothy, age 11, and Gordon, age 9. Both were born in Ridgetown. Uh, address of closest relative in, in country whence alien came. So if somebody came from England, they would put somebody down from England, not necessarily somebody from Canada. So that could give you a place to find them back in England. You just have to be careful. Her father was William Taylor, and he lived in Mull, Ontario. The Ancestry.ca record says Mull, Quebec, but it's Ontario. Um, there is an example where I thought Frank Baker had crossed, and I thought he named his father in England, and I thought that was the right one, and it took me on the whole wrong side of the family. I thought I found the right one. It was the right time period and everything, but... There's another Frank Baker that was crossing at the same time. How dare he? <laughs> okay. Frederick John Butler leaves for work on the U.S. in February of 1920 as a fireman. This is my grandfather. And he and his wife, my grandmother Dorothy, were married in 1919. And his brother was already working in Detroit at Salt Bay. And he was going across to... Uh, work in the same factory. I have never seen my grandfather down as a fireman before. This one surprised me. So that was February. Dorothy Falls in April of 1920. Same kind of thing. Uh, she was born in England. Where is she? There. There she is. English, Leamington. Her father, Samuel Butt, he was living in Leamington as well. Um, she came over in 1907 when she was seven. Okay. There's some. I had to show you those because I wanted you to understand what's coming up, okay? Not so much what information they were giving. Now, immigration and naturalization on the Canadian side. Most of what I've shown you so far is going over to the United States. So those are the American records. This is what is on the Canadian side. So I've given you the website. They've got a wonderful page to explain all about the different immigration documents or non-documents for these time periods. I am not going to explain that to you. You can go on the website and read it yourself. But look at the different dates and how different time periods change. So you've got before 1908. 1908 to 1918, so it's coming up to World War I. So they've made some kind of change there. Uh, during the war, they made a change. 
Between 1925 and 1935, they've made another kind of a change. Wars really do make things change. And we've noticed that even in our own lifetimes with um, the 9-11 and finally having to have a passport to go into the United States. War does change things because security has to be stronger. Okay? So on this website there, they've also got, I think they've got five. I've only picked up three or two. Uh, research, research tips for the Library and Archives Canada. Not all immigrants crossing the border were registered, as I said before. Some crossed when the ports were closed or where no port existed. Many families were not registered because one or both parents had been born in Canada or previously resided here. So we're not like the Americans. You notice in the American records, they were also making records of Americans returning. Canadians are not doing that. So you're not going to have when they came into Canada, you're only going to have them when they entered the U.S. records. And they were considered returning Canadians rather than immigrants. The government of Canada did not keep records of people leaving the country, which, I told, which we know. Like when we cross the border, they don't stop us. They're maybe glad we're going sometimes. <laughs> Who knows? The other thing you need to know is that Canadians were British subjects in the early days. Even when my dad joined World War II, he was considered a British subject. He was not a Canadian. Therefore, when immigrating to Canada from Great Britain, or from any other Commonwealth country. They did not need to apply to become a Canadian citizen. Do not expect to find naturalization records because they're already British subjects. Canadian citizenship didn't happen until the later 40s. Exactly. You couldn't become a Canadian. You couldn't be a Canadian. My dad, they, uh, they, when he joined the army, they said, okay, where was your, where was your father born? Canada. Where was your grandfather born? Canada. Where was your great grandfather born? Canada. Where was your mother born? England. Well, then you're English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can go back to, to uh, loyalists, so <laughs> that's back far enough to be a Canadian. Mm -hmm. So remember that if you're a British subject, you don't have any records to worry about. Darn. Now we got a problem. Remember I told you my grandfather went over to the United States? He is Canadian. But here he is on the Canadian Immigration Service record. In 1921, he comes back to Canada. And as a machinist. So he must have found a skill over here too. A year later, he's coming back to Canada. He's a British subject, but he has a Canadian Immigration Service record. There is also one for his wife, Dorothy. Any ideas why they would have to fill out this form when they are Canadian born, or he's Canadian born, and she's a British subject? Marie? Oh, if they'd apply for it within a year? Well, it takes a while to get it. Another child over there? Yes. My Aunt Iva was born over in the United States. And therefore, they had to claim the child as Canadian. This still happens today. Our son was adopted from Korea. We had to pick him up in New York. And the people at Customs, when we filled out the forms here in Canada before we left, they said, make sure when you cross the border, you declare the child or you don't get the mother's allowance. <laughs> and did you? Yes, of course. <laughs> there was a lot of paperwork. I found this that is in why. In 1972, when, when I came across, my uh, husband was Canadian. 
And that was the one thing they told me to tell me was when you come when she comes across, make sure that she declares your daughter. Yes, so she was born over there. Exactly. <laughs> if you have two Canadian citizen parents, I don't know if it's for one, but I know for two, you will be considered a Canadian citizen. Uh, cousins of ours live in Hong Kong. They have a child that was born in Hong Kong. If they are still planning on coming back to Canada, which I'm sure they will, that child will still be considered a Canadian mm -hmm. because both parents are Canadian. Okay. But the, the child may have to make the claim. I th I'm going to assume it's not automatic. They may have to make the claim. When they come back to the border. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't get anything like births or odd or anything like that. Like in the United States, if there's a child that was born in the military in Europe, they'll do a Military might be different because they've got the paperwork there to do for the military. It might be a different situation than somebody who's just living on their own in a foreign country because they don't have the, the infrastructure to have all that kind of paperwork on them. So it might just be different because of the military. I don't know. I, I haven't looked into the military there. Okay. So. When you go over to the United States and you decide you want to become an American, there are the U.S. Petition for Naturalization. This one's from 1910 for Henry Honor. And he names himself, gives, actually gives his birthday. I only had a year, but he gives his birthday. And in among all this section right in here, he names every child every place they were born, and their the date of birth. Remember those ones I said? Born in California, born in Amherstburg, born in California, born in Amherstburg, born in the Yukon. This was the record that told me that the one child was born in the Yukon. The only problem is, all the birth dates he gives are not the birth dates I have. So, father might not know exactly the right kind of birth date to write that. They're close enough, they're just not quite right. Now, some of the kids were already born in the U.S. They are automatically U.S. citizens. The ones that are born in um, the Yukon, because that was Canadian territory, or would, would be, um, and the, one that, the ones that were born in Amherstburg are a little bit different. And this is how it works. Now, the father applies in 1910. Once the father becomes a United States citizen, all minority children become citizens too. Automatically. Coattails. Coattails. But they have to be minorities. If there was one that was of uh, majority age, if they were an adult, they would have to apply for themselves. As long as they're minority and the parents have applied for U.S. citizenship, mother was already in the U.S., but that's what they had. Yeah. Yes? How far do those um, positions for naturalization go back to you? I don't know. They're on Ancestry. I forgot to write that down. I was just so excited to find this. <laughs> Hey, I've only had a week and a half to work on this talk, and the best part of it was finding all these documents on my family. It pays to do a talk. You should thank us for asking you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, here's a naturalization card that I found on Ancestry as well. This is for Henry Honor. And it says that he's, his address is in Healthburg, California. The typing ink isn't all that great. Um, birth was Amherstburg. His allegiance was to Great Britain. Uh, his birth date and date of naturalization and the witnesses. I don't recognize the witnesses' names because I don't know any of the people that he knew in California. Okay, last one. So even though people in your family may have moved away to another country or another state, it doesn't mean that they were buried in that new country. So I've got Clara Louise Downey Baker, my great grandmother. No, my great great grandmother. She died during the 1918 flu influenza. She died in Detroit, but was buried in Bridgetown, Ontario. 
That's where the family was from. There is no tombstone for her. All I had was the funeral records. That's all I could find at the time. John R. Leach died in Mendota, Wisconsin. That's even farther away. Like, it's not a big stretch to go from Detroit to Bridgetown. But Mendota, Wisconsin in 1933, he's buried in Dewart Cemetery in Ontario. Gladys Helena Honor. Now, you have to understand, she's, she's a relative, but her side of the family is from Ireland, and the family connection is back in the 1600s. She and a sister, uh, mother died when the two girls were young. Aunt, who lived in the United States, took the two daughters and brought them over to, camp, over to the United States to live with her, to be part of her family. Helena Gladys was never happy in, in the United States or Canada. She never went back to Ireland. But when she died in Toronto, she was cremated, and they, the nephew came over, got her uh, ashes, and she's buried in Mount Millick with the rest of her brothers and sisters. So. You can cross the border when you're alive, and you can cross the border when you're dead. My own father what, um, died in Hawaii. He was living six months in Hawaii and six months in Leamington. Uh, was cremated, and they mailed him back to us. <laughs> I, in two weeks, I was sure hoping that he'd be there for the for the reception, and it came, and I. I looked at the box and I said, Dad, I'm so glad you could make it. <laughs> so thank you for listening to my uh, cross-border family, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Dad Clyde, he was born in 1899 in Hesler, Ontario. White died in 1919 in Lansing. And I also found his um, World War One registration plus. Oh, she has found out home. that he had died a month before he was supposed to go and serve. Oh, dear. In 1919? Maybe he died in the flu. From, yeah, well, it yeah. says it was. From uh, 1909, I thought she said. Oh, 19. I couldn't. I thought she said 19. 19, 19. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, yeah, Cindy. Hi, Would you allow us to put the handout on our website for the folks at home as well? Sure. It doesn't okay. have anything really pertinent, but it's got what it's got the uh, email addresses. And, okay. And, um, Great. Thank you. Yes. Something I wanted to mention um, with dual citizenship. Um, my mother in law and cousins, their father was American, the mother was Canadian. They had dual citizenship. But when she, the one cousin joined the service, uh, pledged allegiance to Canada, she lost her dual citizenship. When she oh, interesting. allegiance to Canada, she said she lost her dual citizenship. So, what time, what time was that? It would probably be about 1943 44. Okay, so in 1943 or 44, somebody had dual citizenship between Canada and the U.S., but as soon as she joined she allegiance to Canada, allegiance to Canada she lost the U.S. citizenship. The US citizenship. Yes. My mother lost her U.S. citizenship when she applied for a Canada pension. Lost her U.S. citizenship because she applied for Canada, Canada pension. pension. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. And mine lost hers when she married in Canada. She was born in Saginaw. Came back to Canada when she was about seven years old, lived in Canada, got married, and, and then when she went back to the States to visit, she didn't she was no longer American citizenship. She had lost her dual citizenship. I wonder if that could have been paperwork with that one, that she didn't keep up her paperwork. I don't think so. My guess wasn't that interested in it in the yeah. first place, yeah. So it came as a surprise to her. It actually it came as a surprise when one of her children attempted to become an American citizen using her dual citizenship. It, it was hers was nullified when she married in Canada. Oh, interesting! Nullified when she married in Canada. It could have been what state? But there are people who have dual citizenship because a grandparent or a, or a parent had lived in the states. 
my father-in-law was born over there, brought back here when he was one day old. He's held his American passport ever since. And his children, I don't know if he's dual though, he may just be American, not dual. But his children, two of them, have worked over there, hooked into his American passport, even though they are Canadians, but they can work there. Yes. Both have green cards based on their father, their American father. But they, he didn't lose it, which is interesting. <coughs> My cousin tried to get his his uh, green card over there because of our great grandfather Frank Banker. We've never found any evidence that he tried to become a U.S. citizen. Now, see, my daughter was told, um, and she came over in '73 as a baby, and we were told at that time that if she tried to do try to become a Canadian citizenship or voted over here. Mm. Oh. She will lose her community. She for will US, lose her US, yeah. US citizen. US, US citizens aren't supposed to have this. Right. You can't after 9 11 because I am one. My father has never voted here, never done anything Canadian. No. He has <laughs> done everything he could to retain what he has there for his one day of birth. He must think it's very important then. Well, he's only lived here for 90 years. <laughs> and one day over there. Of course, he he worked over there through his entire career. <coughs> but you heard. Any other questions? Well, now, on behalf of our thank you, thank you so much. A very informative and interesting talk. We do appreciate you on, on short notice yes. uh, filling in and uh, providing us this wonderful. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I'm sure if anybody wants uh, to ask additional questions as you think of them, please don't. Just leave, chat, and uh, if you have further questions, please let us know. Thank you very much. And don't forget, next month, 6 o'clock, British Home Show. Thanks very much. Minimize it. Mm -hmm. I'll put word in orange. Yeah. Really, it's up. Yeah. 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 Yeah.